Welcome to the OmniTalk Spotlight Series, where we highlight the people, the technologies, and the companies that are shaping the future of retail. Today, as part of our 2021 Ask an Expert Series, I am pleased to welcome Ross Sapolsic, Vice President and General Manager, Industrial and Commercial IoT Products at Silicon Labs. Ross, welcome to the show. Hey, Chris. Thanks, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm excited today because back in October, Ross and I actually participated together in a webinar on smart retail technology. I love the experience. I learned a ton. And together with Ross and Silicon Labs, we've decided that we're going to devote ourselves to studying the topic further together in 2021. And today is really our official kickoff of that joint work together. And so for background, uh, I recently published an article on my key takeaways from that webinar, which as of right now, you can find on OmniTalk. And Ross also himself predicted what he thinks are going to be the five key areas or five key trends from a technology perspective. They're going to shape retail and especially smart retail in 2021. And that's why I've asked him to come on today. And that is going to be our focus of the conversation. So Ross, before we do that, with all that background out of the way, tell us about your background. Who are you? What is Silicon Labs? How do you fit in the whole nexus of everything? Uh, happy to. Uh, so uh, I've been with Silicon Labs uh, since uh, 1999. Uh, we were a small startup at that point, and I, I joined the, the company as an applications engineer. Originally, the company started, we were building, if you can believe it, uh, and this may trip up one of my how millennial are you questions <laughs> later. Uh, we were building uh, chips that were doing dial-up modems. So if you remember the old school telephone dial-up modems, that was the start of Silicon Labs. I sure do. That's how I got my grades in college. I remember yeah. that over the holiday yeah. break. Right. Uh, since then, you know, the company's gone through several major transformations as we've moved through. And I've been a part of, of most of those, fortunate enough to be a part of most of those. So we started with these wireline communications, and then we moved into uh, RF communications that was for... Uh, cell phones. So we were doing RF for cell phones. Uh, from there, we moved into doing uh, radios for both AM and FM receivers. Uh, we still have that business that is used in like automotive radios. And we also do um, uh, off-air tuners for TVs. So if you buy a flat panel TV today, there's probably an 80% chance that the uh, off-air receiver inside of it is from Silicon Labs. Okay. Uh, as we moved through those transitions, one of the things we realized was the Internet of Things was going to be a major force in our industry. And so we took a lot of those expertise we've developed through those various other markets that we've played in, and we've dedicated it towards building an, a complete IoT portfolio. And so, when was that, Ross? I'm sorry. When was when was that? Like when you say you started to notice IoT and shift in that direction? Like what what time frame are we talking about here? Yeah. Everyone? So this has not been a we're not we're not a newcomer to the IoT bandwagon here. We really started in 2008. Wow. And, uh, <laughs> 2008, we okay. acquired a company uh, called Integration Associates that had uh, the first radios we were doing for IoT, and I actually helped run that business for a few years, and we were doing. Okay radios that are used in uh, think of garage door openers or um, smart meters that communicate back to the utility, the readings on your meter. Mm -hmm. We had a whole product portfolio around that. And okay. since then we've done a series of acquisitions. Um, we acquired a company called Ember that was doing Zigbee. We acquired a company called Blue Giga that, that was doing Bluetooth. Uh, we've most recently acquired a Wi-Fi company called Red Pine so that we can bring to the table uh, a complete IoT portfolio. So whether you want Bluetooth or Wi-Fi or Zigbee or Thread or Z-Wave or one of these proprietary radios, we have that whole offering that, that we can bring to the table with Silicon Labs. And my role throughout my history here, I started off as an applications engineer. I moved into a marketing role. And then about, uh, I guess about eight years ago, I started running a couple of our businesses. So in a general manager uh, uh, capacity. And now I oversee um, the portion of our IoT business that's targeting commercial, retail, and industrial applications. Got it, got it. So an engineer by trade, I think that's a key thing here, right? By which trade, is great, yeah. which we don't always have on the show either, you know, especially when you're talking retail. Like, so it's good to have 
you know, a hardcore engineer by trade to talk about, you know, where things are going. And I, I think the important thing there too, that I took from that too, is like, and why I asked the question, I mean, 2008, that was a while ago now. I mean, we're talking 13 years ago. And so right. even though you and I are sitting on webinars in October about smart retail, like this thing's been percolating for a while. So it's going to be interesting to get your perspective on what the trends are. Well, right. you do that, right? So like you recently penned an article on the trends that you think are going to shape retail. What, what compels you to do that? Um, you know, I think when we look at, if you take a step back, the way I would describe IoT is it's never been easier to add wireless to a solution to pump data from something to the cloud. So, you know, if, if I go back to that time in 2008, customers were just trying to figure out ways to connect their devices in a cost-effective, energy-friendly way where they could, they could implement these applications. So, so much of the work was, how do I get data from whatever it is, be it an electric meter or, or an electronic shelf label? How do I get that up to, right. a, to the cloud so I can use it? Today, that, that, that's become very uh, turnkey. Pumping data you know, into a Amazon Web Services is really easy to do. What, what, what made that happen? What, what changed? I think there's a few things there. You started okay. to see these standards tech, these real standard technologies. Um, so if I look at some of the metering, for example, previously what would happen is these metering companies would craft their own solution for uh, how they would build a network. Okay. And it was one off and it was bespoke. Um, you see there are standards now that have come out that said, here's a standard um, radio you can use. Here's a standard protocol that would run on top of that radio. And that then allows customers to focus on where they're going to add value, which is what do I do with this data? You know, how do I leverage this data to make it actually be uh, uh, valuable? It improves my business process or it gives me more, uh, have better efficiency, uh, all those types of questions. So um, some of the mainstream technologies have gotten very cost effective. So think of okay. Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. you know, it's ubiquitous. You, you can get a Wi-Fi access point everywhere. Um, but then you'll see for, as you move from Wi-Fi, which is this very high data rate uh, application and not, not in traditionally very battery friendly. And you right. say, I want to do a, a door or window sensor for a security system. When you move down to those other applications now, there are standards that have been deployed um, that allow those networks to be open and interoperable. Okay. So the maturity of, of really those, those radios and the standards on top of them is what made, what's made that connectivity so easy. And part of your, your hypothesis in the paper too is that we're going to start to see some of that start to speed up here now that all of that is standardized in that direction. Why do you think that is? Uh, because now once you build out one of these networks, um, the, 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 the name of the game is what what other services or what other um, you know value can I derive from this network after I've gone through the expense and effort of deploying it? So um, you know what what we what we're hmm. seeing a lot now is somebody will pick a, a killer application that they they want to deploy, and for retail, let's say that is an electronic shelf label, because you want to do. Um, more intelligent pricing. You want to remove the burden of people have to go out, out and manually do pricing. You want to make pricing consistent between your web presence and your physical store. So you say, hey, I'm going to deploy an ESL network. That's a pretty big investment to do. Uh, so, so the question then becomes, now that I've spent the effort to get this first killer app in place, what else can I do with that? Mm. And that's, that's kind of drives a lot of the trends that I highlighted was this convergence of one killer application that kind of gets the uh, retailer to take the plunge. You don't want to have to go through a whole new deployment if you say, let me try to do location services. Oh, that's a whole nother system I have to deploy and go through again. What we see is vendors and customers saying, how can I take this, this primary function, mm -hmm. be it smart lighting or smart pricing and add other features on top of it. So that kind of drove a lot of the trends that, that I was discussing. Interesting. So it's kind of, kind of calls to mind for me, like just to put an analogy in place, it's almost like the 
the highway in the late 40s and 50s, the interstate highway has now been built. And so it's a question of what are these retailers all going to do with it to maximize the value of it? What's all going to be built up around it? It's not just one thing that's going to be built on top of it. It's a lot of it. I, that's a great analogy for a way to think about it. I might, I might steal that from you, Ross, actually. <laughs> Don't be surprised if that pops up in some writing. I got that for you. I can go <laughs> All right, man. Uh, I will credit you, of course. Uh, uh, well, let's get to the trends then, because if because I think conceptually that makes sense, right? Okay, you've seen the investments, you've seen the standardization, things are going to speed up. Let's talk about the five areas specifically. So, number one was asset tracking. What do you think is going to happen in that space in 2021? What do retailers need to know? Yeah, so I think what you see there is asset tracking is uh, if you can understand how people are moving through your store or what product you have within your store, uh, you know, that, that really gives you an operational advantage. And uh, traditionally, if you look at asset tracking, it, it's, been a, it's been a story of uh, the, the expense of doing asset tracking has meant that only really high value assets have been tracked. So mm, if you right. think of a person as being a very high valued asset, you have a cell phone with you, Right. Um, there's been the capability of getting a rough idea of where someone is in the store based on your on your cell phone. And so you could open the maybe the loyalty app when you go in the store, your phone then can communicate with Bluetooth beacons that are maybe happening within the store. And the retailer can say, hey, this is the most valuable real estate I have in the store because this is where customers tend to spend the most time. So you can build a heat map out of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, the infrastructure has been there for a while to do that. I think what you see now is retailers are trying to get more granular data mm -hmm. for more things. So um, where is a particular product in the store or how much right. product is left on the shelves? You know, that that uh, tracking is becoming more cost effective, both in terms of the cost of deploying the solution and the cost of maintaining the solution. If you had to replace batteries on an asset tracker you put in a shopping cart every six months, that's very different than having to do it every five years. So um, what, what we see happening is retailers are saying, okay, I wanna know more about who's in my store, where they are, what product they're interacting with, and then what products I have in my store. Mm -hmm. And that's a big portion of what we see around asset tracking. Yeah, more that's something more granular. Yeah, that's something we've discussed for a long time. Like, how do you get that sense of tracking so you can have the same type of funnel uh, financial understanding that you have, like in an e-commerce arena, so to speak. What are, from an engineering perspective, I'm curious, and not to go too deep into it, you know, but like from an engineering perspective, what are the technologies then that you think in 2021 are going to be the ones that kind of bring that to the fore. Yeah. And so it's been, uh, if, we, if we follow on this concept of kind of more granular and less expensive to like more granular, uh, you know, I want to know where somebody is within 10 meters versus I want to know where someone is within 10 centimeters. Right. Uh, that, that's kind of what drives the, the cost and technology. So uh, Wi-Fi has been able to do this for a while. Uh, so what's really attractive about Wi-Fi is it's very ubiquitous. It's everywhere. And, uh, you know, by virtue of if your phone connects to a Wi-Fi access point in the store, you can roughly figure out where people are oh, with people are. Cheap. How about products? Uh, products, uh, it starts to get trickier then. Okay. Because you want, you know, knowing where somebody is within a couple of meters is probably not good enough to say what shelf is this product located on. So as you move further down, um, uh, ultra wideband, so it's called UWB, okay. uh, can give you really, really fine accuracy down to kind of centimeter type of accuracy. But historically, <laughs> it's been pretty expensive and power hungry to deploy. So uh, uh, that's been for really high value assets. Think of like maybe medical equipment or something like that. Right. Uh, in the middle, there's a, there's a nice emerging technology around Bluetooth. Okay. So Bluetooth now has some capabilities of doing asset tracking down to about a, a sub meter kind of accuracy. So, you know, within a few feet. And uh, what's attractive about Bluetooth is it's very uh, inexpensive and uh, you can get very good battery life out of it. So we see a lot of interest in doing Bluetooth uh, for asset tracking because it fits this kind of sweet spot of 
good enough accuracy at a very good price point uh, with long battery life. But those are the big technologies we see right now, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and UWB. So Wi-Fi, cellular, connect, kind of connecting to that, and then the Bluetooth in terms of like what can really help understand where the products are in space. So really right. Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi mobile for people, Bluetooth for, for products. Okay. You, your second trend was something you actually already mentioned and something that that's actually been, I, I think something we've been, I've been really interested in for a long time, and that's electronic shelf labels. So why did you say that this is the year for that? Because I can talk to a lot of people who are like, this thing is never going to take off. And they will literally fight me to the death right. uh, around that, where I'm like, I just don't get it. Like, there's so many use cases, especially when you use that, you know, kind of super highway analogy. Right. Um, why'd you pick that? Uh, because... You know, it's a market that we participate in, and we're, we're seeing from the from our customer demand a really strong uptake. And I think there's there's a couple things that are driving it. You know, the the story has has been traditionally reduce your cost of maintaining your pricing by putting out electronic shelf labels. Uh, somebody doesn't have to go and put the paper labels on the shelf or change the paper labels on the shelf. And you know that that's that's you can do an ROI calculation on that and make it you know figure out if it makes sense for you or not. But I think what's changed, Chris, is that this idea of okay, if I deploy that now, what else? Mm -hmm. And um, what what we're seeing and hearing is okay, I can do I can update my pricing locally in the store, but now I can tie it into my web presence. Right. So if somebody if you're trying to build this omni channel and you want someone to say. They, they looked up the price online, they saw a certain price, you walk in the store, do they see the same price or is it different? Um, you know, you can now tie your pricing into your web presence. So if you wanna do a flash sale across a hundred stores, now you can just, you know, make the determination and, and have that happen. And react to Amazon too, right? Like, I mean, Amazon was just named the most preferred grocer in America and they, don't even, they barely have stores. So like, right. yeah, now you can right. react in store to Amazon and what they're doing right. online, yeah. But I think the, the idea here is that um, now you're, uh, you're unlocking other services besides just doing pricing once mm. you deploy that, uh, that system. Okay, say so more. The, now you got to be peaked. What's, what, like what? So uh, other things that, uh, that uh, other services they're trying to do with ESL would be uh, having a, a QR code that is part of the ESL tag. Mm -hmm. And now you could scan it as part of your loyalty app. And I could specific to you say, here's the pricing because you're a loyal customer. Mm. Um, so, you know, those types of very personalized services you could offer. What, what uh, an area of convergence we're seeing is uh, there's, we're seeing ESL customers now asking, can they do location as part of, of the tags? And that could be as simple as if you're doing click to cart shopping. So you're doing, you know, Instacart or whatever, you, whatever you're, choice is when the shopper is going through the store, right. the ESLs can flash and say, hey, I'm over here, the product you're trying to pick. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the next stage beyond that would mm -hmm. be the tags know are able to report their location in the store. So instead of someone manually going through and saying, okay, this, uh, this shelf in this aisle is this product, when you stick the tag on, the tag will locate itself and saying, I'm here. And then you can have, you know, the tags identify where the products are instead of a, a, a store associate going and saying, you know. Having to set the price almost. Set. Like, oh, wow. So like if, so, if you have like a robust planogramming system and they know where everything should be in space, the tag knows where it is in space and can then take those price. Wow, that's fascinating. I've never thought about that. Okay. Right. So uh, again, I think the, the goal is I'm going to spend this money to put in an ESL. What other services besides just, you know, the sell, the store associate not having to go and update the price can I offer on top of it? Mm -hmm. So those, those unlocking multiple um, functions with the ESL system is what I think is different now than I think some of the value proposition around it in the past. Right. Yeah. And I think the other thing too, I was talking about this at an NRF show earlier, uh, earlier this month too, is that, you know, it just makes employees happier too, I think is another thing. Like, you know, you start listing out all those use cases and the employees are like, thank God, I don't have to do pricing anymore. Right. All right, well, let's talk the third trend. So this one, 
I got this one. Uh, it's an interesting one for me because I got to tell you, whenever I do a keynote and I take questions at the end, you know, there's always a standard Q and A at any you know trade show or presentation. The one question I always get whenever I talk about the future of retail and how it's going to unfold is someone always invariably raises their hand and asks me about the security question. Right. So what in your mind is happening from a trend standpoint on the security around all of this? Right. So I think, um, you know, security is a hot topic for IoT in general. So, um, you know, the I think when you look at these IoT networks, they tend to be uh, multi-vendor. They'll tend to have mm -hmm. a lot of nodes in them. And so, you know, from a security perspective, the question is, is that a really attractive, I think the proper term is attack surface for someone to say, let me try to hack into this network through one of these nodes. Okay. Um, so, you know, security has been a real challenge for IoT in general, because it's not, when you do security, you have this question of how, how uh, intense of an attack do I want to protect against? Is this um, you know, a state actor who is trying to break into my network, or is this, uh, you know, a uh, a local criminal organization that's trying to break my network. That's that's wildly different in terms of the resources that are available. Right. But I think there's this this realization that when you have all of these nodes that are connected to the cloud, you want to make sure that those nodes are as secure as you can you can make them for however much you can afford to spend uh, securing them. So um, it's been real ad hoc to date, but we're starting to see some regulations that are coming in. Um, that are trying to enforce security in IoT networks. So the U.S. passed a, recently a Cybersecurity Act uh, that, that says if you're going to supply to the federal government, here are security standards you need to meet. Okay. And we think that that's going to become more and more prevalent uh, in, the, in the industry. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, what you don't want to have is, you know, there's been some high profile um, retail attacks you can think of in the recent years. I oh, won't yeah. name any names, I, right? I've, I, think, I think everyone knows I've lived through those. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but that, you don't want your brand to be, we exposed 10 million, uh, you know, credit card numbers from our customers. Uh, you know, that's really, that's really damaging to the brand. Right. So, um, you know, security for for protecting the brand, security for protecting your, your mission critical data, you know, we see that as becoming more and more important in IoT. Mm -hmm. And traditionally, it's been it's been more of an afterthought. But now I think customers are realizing uh, our customers as this uptake in IoT is happening in a big way. Yeah. That uh, you know the potential for abuse by uh, you know malicious actors is growing. So mm -hmm. so we see security as being as being really important. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, there's more nodes, so to speak, in, in how things are operating. So there's got to be more entry points. Yeah, actually, now that you're saying that, I'm thinking to myself, like almost any list that I read in this vein, that almost has to be a part of it. Like that's always got to be top of mind and one of the considerable trends that people need to think through as they're going. All right, well, let's close it out with the last two. I think I think the I think the the fourth one I think is really interesting. And the fifth one was actually my biggest takeaway, which is what I focused my article on. But the fourth one is you talk about just an entirely new way to shop so that you're actually going to see a big change in how people are interacting with retailers in physical spaces, particularly. What did you mean by that? Yeah. So I, I think, Chris, you know, you, I'm, I'm sure you're seeing this across, across a lot of retailers. The, the pandemic has, has uh, accelerated some trends that were already underway and, and probably have forced some new ones uh, that uh, people weren't anticipating. But you know, this, this idea of omni-channel has been there for a while of, you know, I want to look at, I want to look it up online. I want to maybe even buy it online, but I can fulfill it through my local retailer mm -hmm. and, or, you know, click to cart. Um, those I think are, are trends that have been there for a while and the pandemic has really accelerated them. Right. And I think if you're, if you're a brick and mortar retailer, your question really needs to be, what, what, what's the brick and mortar stores doing for me? Love and, that. and I think it's a little different depending on your size and scale. So for, if you're a very large big box retailer, you may view your brick and mortar stores as distribution centers. I have, you know, I have 10,000 local distribution centers where I can get my product to my customers quicker 
than let's say a, a traditional online retailer can. Um, it, but I think there's a reason that there's a question of why, why does someone want to come into the store and what is the experience when they come into the store? So, you know, I think you were, you mentioned this a lot in our, in our webinar was finding a new, finding a reason for customers to come in the store is going to be critical as we come out of the pandemic. And so there are these, these ideas of you want it to be a great experience and you want it to be as frictionless as possible. So, um, you know, today your safety is really a concern. So you want to minimize your interaction when you're in the store. So we see some pretty interesting things that some of our customers are doing in, on that front. Okay. So for example, around fashion, we have a partner of ours who builds um, the loss prevention tags. Okay. And traditionally the loss prevention tags have been just, you know, someone's not walking out of the store. Someone's not stealing my stuff. But what's cool about these tags is they actually built Bluetooth into the tag. So what you can do now is when you pick up a garment, you can have the loyalty app on your phone and it can talk to that Bluetooth tag. So you can get information about the product um, and then you can, you know, even get maybe a sales information, you know, personalizing the price for the customer. But when you decide to buy, you can click on the app and buy it. And then the security tag disconnects itself. Fabulous. So you don't have to go and find a, a cash register. You know, you can, uh, you can just do it all uh, without having to inter interact with the store associate. So, you, so Ross, you're saying, so you're saying we might start to see some of that in 2021 in terms of experimentation and what apparel retailers are, are looking to do. Yeah. yeah. In fact, in fact, our customer, our customer wow. is deploying that today uh, in, in uh, their stores in Europe. So yeah, it's, it's a pretty cool product. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, I've written about how we've just not seen that checkout free movement in that direction. So, so that's okay. So you're seeing you're seeing that type of thing take shape. That's a perfect example of okay, that's a new way to shop apparel. Right. What anything else? Because uh, you know this is really kind of Omnitalk sweet spot. Anything else you're yeah. seeing there? Yeah, I mean, I, if you look at uh, what's been what's being done with some other kind of uh, associate free shopping experiences, the Amazon Go stores. Sure. Uh, so, you know, again, the idea being that you walk in, you open up the app on your phone. Uh, the store is very smart in terms of using cameras and load sensors on the shelves to determine what you picked up, what you put back, uh, having a real time um, understanding of what's in your basket that you're shopping for, and then charging you, you know, when you walk out the door. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, those are the types of experiences I think that uh, are kind of new and novel and are accelerating under the, the new world of the pandemic that we're living in. All right, so last one. Okay. Interoperability. That was the fifth trend you identified. Right. What did you mean by that? Because I this, like I said, for those listening, this to me was the biggest takeaway from the webinar that it makes sense intuitively, but I don't think I knew it before I talked to you and, you know, kind of had a conversation, you know, in a similar vein to what we're doing here, this is far more in depth. Right. But like, what did you mean there? Yeah. So one of the, one of the trends that we see across IOT in general is, um, you know, I mentioned originally there was this idea of, I just need to get things connected and it was really hard to get them connected. Mm -hmm. um, and that created, that when you're in that sort of world that creates these walled gardens somebody goes off and invests in building their system and their system works great but it's you know it's it's a walled garden and what i've seen across all the industries we we play in is customers or let's say in this case the retailers are going to deploy the system they don't want to be locked in to a single vendor they want to have the the flexibility for pricing or for choosing best in breed, uh, pick the right products and then have them work together. So there's been this ongoing trend of, it starts off proprietary, uh, it starts to gain traction, and then there's a strong push to, I, want, I don't wanna be locked in. And so we see that in, in a lot of these areas. So if I use ESL for an example, today, um, all of the ESL solutions are, are uh, proprietary. So they, those solutions won't work with each other. There's a big push now to move to be Bluetooth 
uh, ha as the basis of the communication on those ESLs. And vendors, uh, you know, end customers, retailers like it because they, they feel like they're not locked in. Uh, what will happen is the this, this suppliers start to um, see advantages because then you can have multiple suppliers, um, you know, providing you the components you're building your system with. So, you know, overall, the trend we see in these IoT spaces is going from proprietary to an open standard. And then, you know, you just get a much richer ecosystem of underlying products and services if they can all be built on top of an open standard. Right, and that, then that was the aha for me is like, I think so much we talk about like just point to point solutions like, and you, and you touched on this before too, like right. are pricing labels right for me for this right use case? Well, it's, it's none of the decisions you're making in regards to any of these technologies, anything we talked about is really about that point to point use case. Right. It's really about the option value of doing it for all the other things that can create value too. Right. So, all right, I've got two final questions for you and then we'll get you out of here with our game that we ask everyone to play, which is how millennial are you? Uh oh. <laughs> You'll be, I think you're going to be all right. I think you're going to be okay. all right. We even made one question specific for you, which we've never done before <laughs> since we're going to be doing this together in 2021. Okay. But um, first thing, so, I mean, you've seen a lot, ton of great experience, which you outlined, but if I'm a retailer and I'm listening to this, all right, I'm like, Ross, I get it. I hear you. You've outlined the five trends. You've told me to start on these things. How the hell do I actually do that? What's your advice? Yeah, I, I think that... Um... Knowing, you know, there, I think what, what I see is there's a killer use case that kind of justifies the investment and, you know, identifying what that use case is for you. So, uh, you know, a simple one could be, you could say, uh, I want to save energy in my stores. So I'm going to, I'm going to retrofit my stores with smart lighting and I can do an ROI calculation on that and it all makes sense. So there, there has to be kind of a, a a clear ROI for, for one particular use case to justify the investment. I love but when that. you're do, when you're doing that ROI around that one use case, make sure that those systems that you're deploying can expand to other use cases as you're looking forward in time. So that lighting example, okay, great. I, I install my lights. If I can turn on location services by having those lights as well, now you start to unlock, you know, I've built the roads, what other services can I put on them? So, I, oh, man, that's so good. I love that, man. I mean, I, <laughs> I think, no, that's really good. I've never thought about that. Like, what is your platform IoT use case to start? Right. Think about it in that manner. And then chances are you're going to find a lot of value extrapolated from just doing that in and of itself. Who's doing that well? Last question, like who's doing that well? in terms of what you see in the market as somebody retailers should look to, to actually, I mean, I have to think people have already figured out where some of those places are in their stores and their operations. Like who's doing that well in your mind? Um, you know, uh, I think if you look at uh, Target. Okay. Uh, you're, you're, uh, you know, I think Target really went through a, a pretty massive digital uh, transformation a few years yeah. ago. They did that lighting example you just described. Yeah, 100%. Right. Lighting, uh, I think, you know, Target looks, again, Target is a different retailer than a lot of retailers given their scope and scale, but, you know, they've made a great in-store experience. They've tied that to omni-channel. Uh, I think looking at their stores as distribution centers, and in addition to being, you know, a, a retail outlet, you know, they've put together a, a, a pretty impressive um, retail strategy. Anybody else you'd, you'd think of, Ross? Yeah, so I think Amazon is doing some really innovative stuff around uh, their Amazon Go stores. So the uh, the the associate free uh, stores, uh, you know, they they are developing a, a a platform they can deploy in their stores that really uh, enable a lot of these services. You know, um, a very personalized experience, uh, uh, low friction in terms of I grab and I, I get what I want and I walk out. I, and they've integrated a lot of technology to do that. I think that they're they're really doing some pretty innovative stuff. Yeah, and I keep saying to a lot everyone I talk to, like Amazon Fresh, like one thing you notice we've talked about it here, you know, electronic shelf labels, you know, on their yep. shelves. Like thinking about it, like like you talked about, what are all the things you can do off of that technology? All right, man. Well, that was great. Are you ready? Let's. Are you ready to do this? 
I'm ready. Are you ready as you'll ever be? All right. All right. Question number one. So for those listening for the first time, these are the standard questions that we ask all of our guests, borrowing from basically doing an homage to Inside the Actors Studio. The same three questions. We've asked them now for three years. It, they're actually really great to see the trends in terms of how people are thinking. Okay. With Ross, his background, I can't wait to see what some of his answers are. <laughs> I hope well, I don't disappoint. <laughs> I don't think you will. You can't. You can't. It's going to make for great play at the office, too. All right, Ross, when you're, when you're paying for groceries, are you pulling out a credit card or using, or are you using some form of mobile payment? Like an oh, Apple wow. Pay? Great question. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I try to use mobile as much as I can, okay. uh, you know, with the pandemic, it's made it even, um, uh, I think, uh, more, I, I use it more, uh, two interesting things I've noticed when I tried to go to almost exclusive, uh, you know, phone based payment, the yeah. number of major retailers that don't take it. Uh, and then now that we're all wearing masks, uh, not having face ID work has actually made it a little, uh, has added some friction, right? You got to right. type in your passcode. Uh, but I try to use the phone. Yeah, no one's, no one's said that actually yet. That's really interesting. What we have heard a lot too since the pandemic is a lot more people are now saying tap, like the European yeah. version of tap the credit card yeah. we're seeing. And maybe that's a function of why no one's ever said that. But yeah, that's a great that's a great point. We'll see how that kind of continues to play out. I'm like you, I just, I love just doing the phone thing. It's yeah, and easy. I read actually the fingerprint sensor may make a comeback given that uh, you know we're wearing masks and face recognition isn't working now there's a reason to use the fingerprint sensor so uh, interesting I, I hear it i hear it may be coming back you heard it here first folks i actually love that <laughs> i hate picking my wife's phone up i'm like oh my god this facial this thing stinks but anyway um all right question two how many times in the last week have you ordered food or drinks from an app oh wow uh let's see at least uh three times Okay. And so what, what I, were you procuring? Uh, so let's see. Uh, we ordered groceries. Uh, okay. We ordered uh, delivery from a restaurant. And uh, last night, we're very lucky that we can do alcohol deliveries. So uh, oh. I restocked our, our wine fridge uh, last night. So, so you're uh, ready for the weekend. Ross is ready for the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> right. I love it. <laughs> That's Those great. Dude, great. you're doing pretty well, man. You're doing pretty well. All right. <laughs> I think you're going to do really well, actually. If you could only use one social media platform, or actually, let me not say media. Let me say social platform, based on the answer we've heard in the past. Okay. What would it be and why? One social platform, what would it be and why? Uh, wow, this is probably my um, uh, where I fall out of the millennial category. I would probably be Facebook. Facebook, okay, why? Yeah. And why is this my network there is pretty large. So oh, really? uh, no one said that my, before. Okay. my friends and family, that seems to be the default platform that the most people are on or Facebook. Uh, I, I don't have, I don't have the time or inclination to, to look at Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat. Uh, it, it's probably Facebook followed next in line by LinkedIn. For LinkedIn. I had a feeling that was what you were going to drop. That was yeah. my guess. That was yeah. my guess. The reason I clarify too is some people have said text messaging in the past is the ah, social platform I use the most, which yeah. actually, if you think about it, it's a great answer. So I, I need to make sure I didn't anchor it too much. All right, last question, which is just for you. Okay. Because we heard some things. And uh -oh. as you know, my partner Ann is a big music fan as well. Oh, okay. You're a big music guy. That's right. Spotify try. or vinyl? Oh, wow. Spotify. Oh my God. I didn't think you were going to say that. Okay. Yeah, why? Yeah. Why? Why? Uh, oh my God. You just for, totally won on, you won the millennial <laughs> game. Because for the last 15 years, I really haven't had a setup where I can, I, I have the space or the luxury of having a turntable around. Okay. Uh, and then, you know, uh, just because of my music tastes are kind of eclectic, the ability to just say, what was that? song that uh whoever did in 1985 and instant instantly pull it up uh yeah spotify is in my mind uh it's 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 amazing that i can have such a library uh you know when i want where i want uh yeah so it's spotify for sure that's cool it's kind of it sounds like it's your it's it's uh, my version of imdb for you i think that's what it oh yeah like. that's yeah how i use that yeah with yeah there's a bit of that in. For sure. Movie knowledge too. Yeah. Well, that's cool, man. Well, hey, this has been great. You know, I thanks, Ross. I really enjoyed this conversation. And again, for those listening, we're going to be really talking to each other a lot, 
Ross, Silicon Labs, and I, as we go through here 2021, talking about these trends, talking about what makes, makes a difference here in retail and what we're seeing also from the vendors and the technologies that are going to play a role in that based on what we've outlined and discussed here today. So, so Ross, if people are interested in talking to you, learning more about Silicon Labs, you know, where should they go? What should they right. do? Right. So um, on Silicon Labs, we have a whole, uh, we have a whole section on our website devo devoted to smart retail. So, uh, you know, the best resource would be uh, our website, which is www.scilabs.com uh, slash smart dash retail. So that's a landing page that has, um, you know, all of our information around smart retail and our products that target smart retail. Awesome. 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 You might've lost your millennial status by using the www. Yeah, there you we'll, go. Like, we'll give you a free pass. We'll give you a free pass. <laughs> but anyway, that was, <laughs> got, got to get that last shot in there. But anyway, that was Ross Sabalsik, the Vice President and General Manager of Industrial and Commercial IoT Products at Silicon Labs. Ross, again, thank you so much. It was an absolute pleasure. I really, really enjoyed that interview. And for all of you listening out there, I say it every day, be careful out there.